think um, thank you for attending and we're really excited to do our second meet the expert of the fall 2020 um, virtual field trip semester um, just some kind of housekeeping as Carolyn said if you have any questions feel free to put those up in the Q&A um, we will be checking those feel free to also raise your hand we will have a question and answer um, section at the end of our presentation so um we ask that you maybe hold your hands until that time that way we're not having to stop and break focus from jason while he's giving us all of his awesome information um so with that i will introduce jason he is um, a member of the radiologic science department at nku he's actually the director if i'm correct yeah and fresh fresh uh, this semester <laughs> um and we are very excited to have him here with us today um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, start with my very first question. What is radiologic science? So radiologic science is a uh, profession that works with uh, radiation and specifically x-ray and gamma radiation to produce medical images on patients who are coming in for various problems. Uh, so there are a lot of different branches of radiologic science, uh, and we also have a couple of branches that come off of radiologic science that aren't really dealing with radiation. So when we talk about MRI or ultrasound, uh, technically those are branches of our profession, but they don't use radiation. So, but we still include them because they are medical imaging. Okay. Why did you choose this field? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, so uh, initially I started out uh, wanting to do pharmacy. And so that was what I initially started out in. And, and uh, the more that I saw of it, the less interested I became in it. And um, so I had a friend who was in the radiologic science um, program and we just started talking and I thought, hey, that's, that sounds pretty interesting because it is a mix of um, it's a mix of biology uh, and chemistry and also technology, which I really like. So it actually mixes a lot of different things into it that uh, interested me. Uh, and um, I've been in that ever since. So I, I applied and, and been through that ever since. So you talked about um, switching your major and stuff. What was it like um, to be a student in that time? And That's, yeah. Okay. So um, well, anytime that you're a student, I don't think that you realize it um, beforehand at high school, and, but you definitely do after you've been a student. But it's it's obviously a, a time that you're you're nervous. Uh, you're trying to make good decisions and right decisions about what you want to do later in life. Um, and, you know, I, I can remember being that way, thinking to myself, especially when I went from pharmacy to radiologic science. I, I remembered uh, that I, I really wasn't sure. Um, but the further along that I got, uh, I realized that I enjoyed uh, the profession and um, it was very interesting to me. I've never really had a time where it didn't interest me. And uh, I think that's a big part of it. So it should be something that you're really excited about. Uh, and even though you're nervous, about it. I think that's that's part of it. Um, we all want to make good decisions and make the right choices, but at the end of the day, if it's something that you're, you're interested in or you're comfortable in, you probably won't regret it. Okay. So before coming to NKU, what is some um, jobs or other things that you held as a radiologic? Um, yeah, a technologist. So, um, so when I initially got out, I actually worked in a hospital in Lexington, and I started out there just doing uh, radiographs, so traditional x-rays. And at that point in time, and still yet some today, they would actually uh, get people to what we call cross-train. And so they would take you into different, uh, the other modalities and cross-train you in that so that you could work in those as well. So I, at Lexington, I actually learned to do surgery, which I loved. Uh, so we, we go in and do a lot of surgery, and I just absolutely love that. Um, I learned how to also do a CT, computed tomography. And so I picked those two things up there. Um, 
And then I started uh, a move back home, which is in Fleming County. And that started at Fleming County Hospital uh, as an x-ray tech or radiologic technologist. And there I did x-ray and CT. And then at that point, I also picked up something called bone absorptometry, which is a little, just a really massive word, but it's not that scary. Um, and learned how to do that. And so uh, from there, uh, I went to work at uh, another place in Maysville where they had some more opportunities for me. And I picked up on cardiac catheterization and uh, nuclear medicine. So um, and at that point I, I, at Fleming County, I was actually um, associated with working with students at the local university in radiologic science. And I really, I, re I knew I really liked working with them. And uh, it, it's really a positive thing because it almost keeps you fresh on things that are going on in the profession as well. So, um, so from that point, I actually joined uh, Moorhead State University uh, where I worked for five years there. And uh, during that time, I also was doing uh, nuclear medicine studies on the heart at a cardiologist office uh, during the summers. And so um, finally I joined NKU. And so that's where I've been from there. So I, I really have a pretty extensive background in, in working in the profession. Uh, and also since 2002, which is when I actually started teaching it as well. So, so awesome. had a lot of things going on. That is awesome. Um, so uh, we do have a student question yes. and it ties into one of my questions that I was about to ask. Um, what's the future in radiology? Is there anything new or experimental that's being worked on right now? Well, being a, a technology-based profession, uh, anytime that new technology comes around, we benefit from that. And so there are, there are a lot of different things occurring and, and you wouldn't really, unless you knew about it, you really wouldn't say that it was experimental, uh, but it, it really is. So when we look at uh, CT, which is one of them, um, CT, uh, we're looking at doing what's called multi-slice or multi-row detectors. And so currently, right now they can take 64 images per second on a patient. And so what they're actually pr uh, pushing is to be able to do up to 300 per second. Now, it doesn't really sound like much, but if you think about it, um, in order to do the heart, you have to do it very quickly so that, because you, you can't stop the heart to image it, but if you can do an image very quickly and cover the entire heart in one heartbeat, then you get a, a picture without motion and uh, a much better quality image. So that's one of the, the things that we're doing. Um, uh, radiology just re recently, probably in the last 10 years, benefited from transferring from film to digital imaging. So what you do on your iPhone, you take a picture and you can store it on your phone. We actually can do that in radiology now. So we store everything electronically and uh, transferred electronically. So uh, w there's all kinds of technological advancements. Um, I, we can look at MRI. Uh, MRI is actually moving into um, uh, where, we, where we are looking at function of, of cells rather than actually what the cells look like. So if you think about my profession, uh, we see things as they are. Uh, and if you're looking at their function, you're seeing things as they function or work. And so uh, that's a way to more quickly identify problems in the body when you can identify two to three cells that are functioning abnormally. And so that's one of the things that we're really looking at. And it's called molecular imaging. So it's, it's imaging down at the level of the molecule rather than on the big, big stage. That's, that's really cool. That sounds... <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, and we've got more. That's a, that's a massive question. I probably could spend the whole time on that, but I know we don't have a lot of time. All right. So we have talked about um, radiolog radiologic science as uh -huh. a whole, kind of some of the nice stuff. Um, can you tell us about the UMI project? This is something you've been working on personally. So let's kind of get into that because it's always fascinating. Yeah, um, it, it mixes two of the things that, that I really um, 
were fascinated with, and, and to this day, I'm still fascinated with archaeology. And uh, so I had uh, one of my associates approach me about, hey, would you like to do uh, a CT scan and imaging on uh, a mummy? And me, uh, being that my passion is also in archaeology, yeah, there's no way I could have turned it down. So we um, worked with uh, my colleague and we worked it with the Cincinnati Museum Center and they actually have a mummy there that is about a three to five year old child that they'd had in their possession for quite some time. And they were looking at putting that, the mummy on display for last summer. And so they wanted to do some updated imaging so that, so they could put that in with the display and we found, uh, my colleagues uh, found a way to include student learning with that process. And um, so uh, back in January of last year, we brought the mummy in. We had the Cincinnati Museum bring it in. It was uh, almost a parade to, to come into the university. Um, when we wheeled the, the mummy into the, the building and the department, we had all kinds of eyes on us. We had a lot of media there. Uh, covering it, and our students got an opportunity to do both uh, x-rays on Umi and just to, to see what's on the inside of his cartonnage, which is what he's covered in. And then since we recently got a new CT scanner, uh, we took him back to CT and we did our CT scan on Umi. And one of the outcomes that the museum wanted, and as well as us, was we wanted to um, take that information we got from the CT scanner and print a life-sized replica of what Umi looks like inside of the wrappings without actually opening them up. And so since the university had purchased a 3D printer, that was the perfect timing. And so we developed a way to scan the patient, uh, scan Umi, I keep calling him a patient. Uh, we developed a way to scan Umi and transfer that information in, uh, to a computer where we can manipulate it and produce a three-dimensional, uh, a realistic image of what Umi looks like. And uh, if you don't, if you uh, want to, at the end, I've actually got images of it, so. Oh, uh, you're mute, muted. <laughs> okay. uh, we do have a question. Um, yeah. um, Aliana, and I'm so sorry if I mispronounce your name, would like to know if you could tell how the mummy died. That's a great question. That was actually one of the questions that the museum center wanted to know. And uh, I apologize if any of you are slightly grossed out, but the medical profession does have some things in it that are, um, uh, that to some can be gross. But um, we scanned his entire body and uh, during the mummification process, they actually remove all organs except for the heart, which we could identify, both eyes that we could identify. Uh, and other than that, the bones were all that were left in there. And so if the person did not have any damage or injury to the bones, um, then there's really not much of a way to, to tell what actually uh, killed him. Now, uh, we did identify a couple things that, that I personally didn't know about, and I think that um, the museum center wasn't exactly aware of either, but they had removed Umi's head uh, to remove the brain from the skull. And uh, initially we thought th that he had had an accident where he had broke his neck, but it was done with just very nice and fine um, surgical precision with it, and we knew that, that they removed it simply to remove the brain. So we weren't able to tell what caused his death uh, because the internal organs were basically gone. Uh, we, could, we have several assumptions. Um, could have been TB, uh, tuberculosis, that was pretty common during that time, um, but um, that's about as far as we can go with it. We couldn't really, could do more than assume. A good question, though. That's that's one that we've been asked. All right. Um, so, why is the UMI project so important to um, your field, but just the health community and the academic community? 
Well, uh, it's actually, uh, it actually transformed from something that was a cool project for our students uh, into almost a, a new um, field of, a new field of science or uh, a, a new direction that our, our profession hadn't went into. So what we were able to do is we took all the information from that CT scan we, we transferred it to a computer and then we manipulated that information to get a, a 3D print from it. And so uh, what we were able to come up with, and I've actually had a couple of, of physicians uh, talk to us about this, uh, we can replicate a lot of body parts from that. So let's say if an individual had an amputation of an arm or a leg, if we scan that patient, we can actually replicate that amputated leg and uh, build a new one for them. And so we, we, we can go into prosthetics. Uh, the, the quality of that reprint is to within 0.6 millimeters. So it's really a much finer fit than what you would get by a handmade prosthetic. Uh, I have had other physicians um, uh, electrocardiophysiologist, so I know that's a, a huge name, but anyway, he deals with um, the heart and the heartbeat, and he actually approached us about printing uh, heart valves for um, uh, for repair in patients who, who have heart valve tr trouble. So these are things that five years ago we would never have thought about, and so now we, we are at NKU have something that, um, you know, we can uh, we can offer to uh, other people and teach them, teach them how to do this, this process, how it can be done. So, uh, so it was really a very positive thing for NKU, not just for the students, but for other things as well. Okay. So that's kind of the bigger 3D um, impact. Mm -hmm. Tell us how it was printing, Amy, like the time, the uh, materials, like all of that that went into it. Yeah, so uh, this was our very first time at, at printing or using a 3D printer whatsoever. And so a colleague of mine, uh, a colleague of mine and myself, we went to a, a seminar to, to learn how to print things. And so uh, printing was easy because it, it showed, a, it said, here's your files, you do this and this comes out. And so it seemed really simple, but our problem was moving those files from our CT scanner to a computer that can convert it to something that can be printed. So uh, that part we worked on, but uh, Joe and I uh, spent a lot of time um, working with printing and it eventually, just to give you an example, we had to print UMI in four different sections because it could only print in 12 inch sections. And so UMI is roughly 36, 37 inches tall. And so that means we had to break him into three to four sections to print him. And so the head was actually 25 hours to print. Uh, it took me probably five hours to recreate the data to print him. Uh, and that sounds like a lot, a lot of time, but when you're doing something for the very first time, uh, you're not as uh, you're not as fluent with with everything, and it just takes so much longer. We've actually whittled that down quite a bit, uh, but that very first time we were experimenting, we were we were taking our time, we were trying to do it right, we we're trying to do it, uh, a, a great job, and so it took 25 hours for the head, uh, it took 18 hours for the chest. Um, it took about 15 hours for the pelvis and then it took about eight hours for the legs. So all in all, we had over a hundred hours just in printing. And I know that sounds like a, a super long time, uh, but we have come up with ways to, to uh, reduce the time quite a bit, but it's still, if you've ever printed anything on 3D, it still takes a long time, especially for something that large. And uh, yeah, and you asked me about what we printed with too. So uh, we had a couple of options. Um, 3D printing actually can, we can do a lot of different things, use a lot of different materials. So we can use what's called ABS, which is a, a type of plastic that's real common uh, in a lot of households and cars. They use ABS a lot in those. Uh, 
uh, but we chose something called PLA, which is polylactic acid. And it's actually made from um, sugar cane and it's biodegradable and uh, it's, a, it's really easy to use. Uh, and actually, if, if someone ever come up with a question, I see we do have a question down there, um, to put Umi together, uh, the only thing that we needed to do was use a soldering iron and heat up the, the joints and he went together, he just melted right together because it's only about 200 degrees, I think is as warm as it has to get for it to, to melt together. So, um, so, you know, he is biodegradable. Uh, so it, it was an environmental uh, choice that we made. So should they not want to use him anymore, then they can basically put him in the recycling bin and, and uh, get him back to nature, so. Okay, um, so what is the future for um, your UMI project? Or is it is it come to its close or is there more to still be done? No, uh, right now we're kind of at a plateau. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of how research is, is you, you come up with something, uh, you work, you work, you work on it, and then you kind of reach a, a point where you have to develop new ideas. Uh, for it. And so that's kind of where we are. Um, my colleague and I who worked on it with in 3D printing, we are actually going to be going to Jacksonville, Florida and doing a national presentation on it. And so that's right, really where we are right now is taking what we have learned and telling other people about it. Um, we have a, a, some ideas about what we could do with UMI. Um, we, we've, we've got to establish connections with people so that we can do that. Uh, but we would really like to be able to um, recreate Umi's face. And so do, doing facial reconstruction on his face, uh, we know some people who can do that. Uh, and we would also like to recreate what his voice would sound like. And so that's something, since we, the information that we have, that we know that that's, we're capable of doing that. So we can actually see what Umi sounded like. Um, we can see what Umi looked like. And um, so those are some of the things that we're, we're really interested in kind of looking at next. Uh, we have seen a couple of my colleagues um, in different states who have taken, taken scans of people and recreated their voices. So, and it's been a, a fairly accurate recreation. So we thought, well, that would be good to do with, with Umi is to see what he sounded like. Uh, and so that's, that's where we are from this point is taking that information uh, and doing that. Another thing that we're looking at and, and what we did do, I know it's not UMI, uh, but we had uh, someone in the biology department bring over a Madagascar hissing cockroach uh, and we scanned it and replicated it. We printed a 3D model of it and he actually wants to put it into virtual reality so that when he teaches with it, he can actually have it in virtual reality and move it around and talk about the different parts to it. So that's another thing that we're looking at. Uh, and that one is, is fairly easy. Um, we have also been able to replicate some other things. So if we were looking at the engineering department, uh, they could bring over something that they want, would want to replicate and we could replicate it down to, to pretty, pretty accurate measurements. So we, we've got a lot of things. We're, we're trying to work with other departments, which is really important. That's that whole thing with collaborating with other professions. And that's what we're looking at now is to be able to do that. And speaking of working with other departments, one of the questions is what makes NKU's medical and biomedical sciences program significant compared to other colleges? And I think most of what you've talked about kind of hints at that. So feel free to... Yeah, that. sure. So uh, <laughs> we have, uh, as far as our, our radiologic sciences, we are a bachelor's degree, which is fairly unique. Uh, we went to that about three to four years ago. Uh, and uh, what that means for our students is originally it was an associate degree. So now we're a bachelor's degree. And what it means is once you have a job that you, you have a, a leg up on students who graduate from other uh, from other schools because you have a bachelor's degree. And so that means that you are, uh, you've been trained in other things. Uh, you have a more diverse education. And uh, so that's one of the things that we feel like we've got a leg up. 
the other thing is uh, we are the only uh, program that I am even aware of that has a functioning CT scanner. So when we got that, that we were, we were doing things that no one in the area was able to do. Uh, the reason we got that CT scanner is because we have a, uh, a, a, a CT program or a course uh, where our students, when they graduate, rather than just doing radiography, they actually do radiography and are able to, to be certified in computed tomography or CT as well. So that's something that NKU's program has that, that no one else uh, has. Uh, has. Uh, there are some other CT programs, but they do not have that, that CT scanner there. Take students in, talk about, share, let them operate it uh, without worry about uh, you know, causing, uh, making a mistake or causing problems or anything like that. So that's where we really, um, that, where we really outshine some of the other schools. Um, and then um, Mallory asked um, if there are any programs or strategies that would help with becoming a radiologist. Okay, so uh, Mallory's question is uh, a radiologist is asking about a radiologist and just I want to make sure that we, we clarify there is a radiologist and then there's a radiologic technologist. Mm -hmm. So a radiologic technologist actually is, is the ones who produce the images, who work with patients to... Uh, to get their images done. And the radiologist is the one who interprets those images. And so um, we are the level uh, the assisting that radiologist. Uh, radiologic technologist works under and with a radiologist. Now, that being said, a radiologic technologist uh, easily can become a radiologist. Um, and so we, we, that we can be used as a stepping stone for that. So the question be is what experiences or things that would help become a radiologic technologist? Well, we're very science and medical heavy, obviously. Um, we, uh, if you want to, to become a radiologic technologist, you want to look at anatomy and positioning because we're very heavy on that, our anatomy and physiology. Uh, we also uh, look at uh, the sciences and specifically chemistry and physics. Now, I know that some, that's scary to some of them, um, but uh, you know we have radiation biology uh, and radiation physics as a part of our course. And so we do learn about physics. And if you take physics, then you have a background and it's a little bit easier for you. So that's the reason why we, we uh, suggest that. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a radiologic technologist, I would even uh, ask about shadowing at a, a local hospital or maybe even a a doctor's office that has a radiology uh, department. Uh, the reason, and unfortunately with, with COVID-19 and how we are now, that's a little bit harder to do, but sometimes you can call up the office and get that worked out. And, and they usually will allow you to do that for a day. Just kind of come in and see what's going on, what they're doing and whether or not you, you like that. Uh, Cause I think that's a big part of it is, uh, you know, some people have this idea of a profession and then when they actually get to it and, and do it, it's not exactly what they expected. So it's a good idea to, to, to shadow somebody and to see it before you actually go into it. And then to kind of tie back to the mummy, somebody asked how old was he? Yes. Yeah, I caught, I saw that earlier. So I uh, had that, that answer ready for you. So uh, there are two ages that we want to talk about with Umi. Uh, Umi was a three to five year old child, and we know that because of a lot of different things. We were able to see that the growth plates in the bones uh, hadn't sealed up yet. We were able to see adult teeth that had not came out yet, uh, so they still had baby teeth. Um, and so we were able to determine his age by that. Now, the other cool part of it, and probably what the question is asking about, is how old was Umi? And from the cartonage and looking at things, how the burial was done, we are seeing Umi as being around 2,000 years old. So Umi was alive at about 100 AD, uh, which was a time in Egypt where, uh, if you've, you've had your history lessons, um, we had uh, the Great Library at Alexandria. We had um, the, actually the, the lighthouse at Alexandria. And so um, Egypt was under Roman control. Uh, Cleopatra 
for he it's possible he may have known Cleopatra. It's po- you know seen her or knew of her. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of of the age of Umi. So we're we're talking two thousand years old, uh, and that's about what was going on during that time frame. And then um, another question I had about Umi. So you um, talk about going to conferences, and I know for one of the conferences you went to, you had taken him. What was yes. it like transporting Umi? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, <laughs> originally when we, we took Umi to Chicago uh, to present him up in Chicago, and um, so Umi is about like it's about 38 inches long. And so the best way to transport him was in, in the sections that we printed him in. So I put him in a duffel bag uh, to go to the airport and fly. And I did have some eyebrows raised when we went through the scanners. Uh, but I did tell them beforehand that I have a, a 3D printed replica of a mummy in there. And so I did have some of the TSA guys not you know, not come at me as if I was doing something wrong, but they wanted to see inside the duffel bag. So uh, they were really, they said that they'd heard about Umi and they wanted to see what what it looked like. And so we opened it up and we had a a showing basically uh, to the TSA at the airport. Um, So, but we were, there were three of us traveling to go up there to do the presentation. So we were all a little concerned about carrying in uh, a 3D printed body uh, through through airport security uh, because Umi is accurate. Uh, he ha- all of his bones are printed. Uh, he is anatomically accurate uh, down down to the heart, to the eyes, all of that. So uh, it was a little bit nerve wracking at first. Um, and then we have one more question that'll kind of tie into this and then we'll ask a, a personal sure. question and then we'll release the gates for them to Okay. Ask all of the questions. So uh, Trinity would like to know uh, whether working with archaeology is common for a radiologist. Or- um, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say, have to say no, unfortunately. Um, it, and it would depend upon where you are. I will tell you this, and it was a Trinity, was it? Is that, okay. Uh, that, that in Egypt, they actually have, Egyptian mummy radiologist. And so they may find a cache of 400 mummies and, you know, the hospital that's there, basically they're going to get them to to scan them and to extra text rate. They want to know who's in it. um, You know, what, what status, social status they had, things like that. So if you're in Egypt, you probably would, but here we literally have one mummy and, um, you know, he get he got a lot of attention, but unfortunately, there's only so much you can do with one mummy around here. So, uh, other things, um, I have heard of them using radiology to to find what's in sealed jars, uh, and so uh, that that can happen. But again, we we don't have a lot of that occurring here. Uh, so. It was a very unique experience. Uh, we don't work that closely. I do. I have made ties with Cincinnati Museum Center. Uh, I would actually had actually talked about uh, bringing over a dinosaur egg and scanning it to see what the fetus was inside of it. Um, so that would be paleontology that we were looking at. Um, we have a, unfortunately COVID nineteen hit before we were able to get that uh, accomplished. So maybe sometime next year we can look at doing that. But. Um, it you working at uh, a, a university that has access to what we have, the equipment we have. We're able to approach the, these uh, professions and say, "What do you got? I'd like to help. I want. I want to. You know, we we want to learn from this, and we want to help you learn from this." So, um, so we're in that unique situation. If you're out working in it, you probably that's a once in a lifetime experience. Uh, you're probably not going to see that unless you worked in Egypt. Okay. Um, and then just to kind of follow up, just to kind of give more of a personable aspect, what are some of your hobbies outside of the uh, field? Well, uh, great question. I've got uh, three kids. So um, 
right now, part of what I do outside is watching my daughter. Uh, I've got one daughter that's in college. She's actually looking to be a veterinarian. Uh, I've got another one who's in high school. She's a, a big soccer player. And so we, a lot of days are filled with going and watching soccer games. Uh, and then my youngest boy, he uh, loves sports. And so uh, we like to go watch University of Kentucky football, basketball games. Um, uh, I dabble. Sometimes I do some carpentry work. Uh, I can do electrical and plumbing, things like that. And so I kind of keep busy with, with that sort of stuff. So I, I, if you can tell by my background in in imaging, I just – I learn a lot about a lot of different things. And so I'm kind of the same way outside of that as I like to, if I see something interesting and interests me, I, I try to learn more about it, whether it's, you know, uh, whether it's working with carpentry or whether it's working with 3d printing or whatever it is. So I, I just like to learn about different things when it comes out. And is there anything else you would like to tell us about you yourself, your field, anything in those lines before we open up questions? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short because I know that they may have some questions to ask. So, um, yeah, my profession, when I initially started out in it, um, I had a very narrow uh, a very narrow view of it. Um, I didn't really understand uh, as well as what I should about where it could take me. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> we, and, and I'll, I'll throw this out here just to give you an example. So uh, I'm, I live in Kentucky. I'm from a very rural area and um, working with UMI <clears throat> has taken me to uh, Chicago, Illinois. It's going to be taking me to Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, we had actually discussed going over to Ireland to also present UMI in Ireland at the international conference. Um, I've had uh, people work calling me from all over uh, the, the United States asking about UMI and working with UMI and how we did things. Um, so I had a very narrow view initially about working in the profession. I, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm doing x-rays on, on patients and that, that's it. And the profession is so much bigger and more wide open than that. Um, I can do x-ray, we can go into CT scan, I can go into MRI, I can I go into ultrasound, I can go into bone densitometry, I can do surgery, I can do uh, orthopedics, which is working with bone. I can do nuclear medicine. I could go into cardiology. Uh, I could go in to be a radiology uh, radiologist assistant, which is a level in between the radiologic technologist and the radiologist, where I would actually be reading uh, patients' images and working with patients still at the same time. Um, and then at that, then I got the opportunity to come to the NKU and teach. And so uh, then that opened up a whole other avenue. And so the profession isn't just I'm taking x-rays. There are, there are so much other places that you can go with that. And you shouldn't really limit yourself to saying, oh, that's all I'm going to do. Because in five years, your, your, your interests and your plans change. And there are so many other places that you can go just with that. All right, that's great. So um, now is time for students to begin really asking questions they may have. I know I threw in a couple throughout our thing because they kind of fit in with our subjects, but sure. feel free to start putting some questions in the Q&A or if you'd like, you can raise your hand and I'll um, make it available for you to speak. Um, but we already have two. So any advice for eighth graders, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic? Um, yeah, I'm pulling up the questions, kind of looking at them too, just kind of prepare for it. So, uh, COVID, so any, yeah, COVID-19 has presented a challenge for all of us. Um, our students that are in our program are still allowed to go to, to hospitals to, to practice what we, we've been teaching them. Uh, but they are limited because, uh, as a student, we have a responsibility for your health and safety, um, as well as your, your growth, uh, in the profession and learning about the profession. So um, our students are not allowed to work with COVID-19 patients. And so that kind of limits what they're able to do a little bit. Um, but um, if, I, if you were very interested in learning about 
uh, the profession, I would start with the with the internet. Uh, you heard me mention about CT, MRI, ultrasound, bone dense tometry, uh, cardiac catheterization. Um, start looking into those. Uh, I would I would go on the internet and look to see what that is. YouTube uh, is is fabulous because if you want to know about uh, something, there's a YouTube video describing it or showing it to you. So, uh, you know, if you, if, as long as you type in the right information about YouTube, you can probably pull up and get a better understanding of what's actually going on. Uh, if you look up uh, radiologic uh, anatomy, uh, anatomy and positioning in radiology, uh, there probably will be students on there who are showing you how to do certain positions in radiology. And so uh, we, we would have students who posted on YouTube that so for grade. And so there's a lot of different ways um, that you can kind of learn about it. Uh, if you know someone who works in the profession, talk to them, you know, ask them a question. Don't be, a, don't be afraid to talk about it because they will be more than willing to share, uh, share it with you. Uh, I see one here. Uh, is that okay? How, yeah, hard is your, how hard is your job? Okay. All right. So Every job is a challenge at some point. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, there are things about your job that you love and are easy and that just come just super easy. And then there are parts that are challenging. And what is hard for me may not necessarily be hard for someone else. Uh, but I will tell you about some things uh, that were, were a challenge for me. So initially I mentioned to you that I went from Fleming County Hospital to Maysville Hospital. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that uh, we had uh, some, some children come in multiple uh, in different episodes that uh, they had gotten into, uh, they'd had injuries and that was really difficult for me to deal with, especially since I knew the, the people. Uh, they were from my community uh, and it happened in about a uh, three month period, we saw a lot of stuff going on. And so that was really difficult for me to digest. And so that was a hard part of the job. And I know that Tristan, whenever she was actually asking that, she was probably asking about academically or physically. Um, the program is, I like to use the word challenging because if, when I mentioned to you about radiation, or radio, radiation biology, and then we talk about radiation physics, those are courses that have a challenge to it. And so that's the reason why you should really prepare for that challenge. When you're prepared for a challenge, and I like to say this to my students, uh, if you think about it, what if you had a school bus that had a wreck and, student, and you had 30 students come into a hospital that's only able to deal with five students? Believe it or not, that hospital is still capable of dealing with that because they plan for chaos. And so if you plan for challenges, then you're ready for the challenge and you can face it a little bit easier. Um, we've we had that happen before. We had a, a bus that come in and had 30 students on it and we had to work with those 30 students and get their images, but we had a plan for it. We knew how to, to, to deal with that. And so we plan for chaos and that makes it a lot easier to deal with. So uh, is it difficult? Yes, I, you're not gonna find a, a job that uh, that isn't. But if you're interested in it, it makes that challenge easier. If, you're, if you have an interest in it and you have a drive in it, it's going to be easier for you. But that's a good question. Uh, how would you use radiology when dealing with nuclear medicine? Aha, okay, great question. So they're actually tied to each other, but they're, they're totally different. Um, radiology is when we pass radiation um, through a patient to get an image of inside the body. Nuclear medicine is when we give a patient a, a medicine that is radioactive and the cells take it up and give an image from the patient. So nuclear medicine is a branch of diagnostic imaging, but it's not directly related to radiology. Uh, so they're, they're a little bit different. I like to do both because one of them is a physical imaging, meaning that you, when you shoot through that patient, you're seeing what's inside. The other one is a functional imaging, which I talked about before, where we can see 
Uh, let's let's take this for example. So a, a person has a, a broken leg, but it's not broken bad enough to see on an X-ray. If you give them a specific radioactive medicine, uh, we call it a radioisotope, it will go into the bone and it goes into the cells that are really active. And those are cells that are repairing a, a break. They'll go into those cells that are really active and they'll show up really bright on our images. So we can see the fracture simply because the cells are active and not because we can physically see it. So that's how they relate. Uh, does it take to be a radiologist? Okay, so again, I wanna make sure I clarify this. A radiologic technologist, uh, which is uh, the program that we have, uh, is generally four years. Uh, now, if you want to be a radiologist, a radiologist is gonna take uh, probably about eight years. Uh, because you first have to get your bachelor's degree, which is four years. Then you go through two years of medical school and then about two to three years of residency. And so it's, it's about eight years for that. What are we doing when dealing with COVID? Okay, so COVID is, has been a challenge. Um, uh, the last uh, research that I see have seen about one in seven individuals who uh, have contracted it are healthcare professionals. So they're nurses, they're radiologists, they're technologists, they're lab, uh, uh, lab technologists. So uh, what we are doing to deal with it is we're, we're using uh, uh, personal PPE. You may have heard that on uh, some of the news. We're using personal protective equipment. Uh, we're using what's called an N95 respirator mask, which is a, a very high filtration mask. Um, the masks that you are probably wearing to school, have the ability to, to filter out water droplets. Uh, and that's what uh, one of the reasons why it protects someone else rather than yourself, because if you cough, it catches the water droplets. Um, but um, the N95 mask, the, is, the filtration is so small that it actually catches the COVID virus itself. So they're more expensive. They actually have, you actually have to be fitted for an N95 mask. You can't just wear one and say, oh, here's an N95 mask. So you have to be fitted for those. Uh, and so those are ways that we are uh, protecting ourselves is uh, if, you, if you, ha you probably haven't been into a hospital in that area, uh, but areas, they have areas in the hospital that have COVID patients that are sealed off from the rest of the hospital. So anyone that works in there, when they come out, they have to, they have to, to basically disinfect uh, before they leave. And when they go in, they have to put on their personal protective equipment to go into it. So they're actually isolated from other uh, places. Uh, as far as us, if we have to go x-ray those individuals, uh, there is a designated person to go do that. And so that's, that's so that we can contact trace for that person. So it is a, a pretty uh, in-depth process for it. So it's not really that easy. Uh, is it like contrast? So uh, contrasts. So uh, let me, so uh, contrast to me when you mention contrast is what? Oh, I know what she's going, getting into. So she's talking about uh, when we talked about injecting radioactive materials into a person. So no, contrast is different. So contrast is actually a fluid that has a very it, that has an element in it called iodine that's very dense. And so the reason why we want something very dense in this is because it, it stops x-rays from penetrating it. And so when you inject contrast into somebody, whatever it's in stops the x-rays from penetrating it and you see an outline or a shadow of that structure. So we would inject contrast in, or give contrast to someone to if we wanted to see their stomach, which is a soft, organ. We can't see that really well on x-ray. So if we give them contrast, we can see that organ and we can see what it looks like. Um, we would also give it for kidneys. Um, so you don't really see function with contrast in most, most cases. Uh, and whereas nuclear medicine, we see function, we see cells function. So that's, that's really the difference. All right, we have time probably for one more question. Okay, sure. Uh, so I see what three is that right? Yes. Okay. So okay. Well, let's let's see. I maybe get one or two of them here. So are there risks with nuclear medicine? So our profession 
Uh, we have governing bodies that tell us what is safe and what is not safe. Those governing bodies have set up limits for us that tell us that our profession is no more dangerous than if you went to be a carpenter or you went to be a welder or you went to be a secretary. The risk for you, from you, for you dying from our profession, uh, they consider to be 12 days. If you're a male, it's almost a year. So being a male is actually more risky than being in our profession. Uh, he's okay if I go a couple more real quick, maybe. Uh, so where, uh, when, who can, oh, who come up with the idea to copy the mummy? So they tell us about the mummy and uh, we did. So we just developed it. We said, hey, we've got a 3D printer here. Uh, the, the guys at the museum were like, we'd really like to have a copy of this. And, and so we just came up with it. So uh, it was us. And if you want to, at the very end, I'll show you what the, the mummy looks like. So is, it, is this job free of stress? No, uh, I don't think there is such a thing. Um, it's both rewarding and stressful. Uh, I have had patients who were dying from cancer who come up to me and wanted to bring their family and thank me because I had treated them so well and had done everything that I could. And as, as wonderful as it was for them to have done that, it actually was very difficult for me because I knew that I would not see them again. Um, and so there are parts to it that are stressful. If you have a person come in, people come in from a, the bus accident that we talked about, there's no way that's not stressful. We plan for it so that we don't make mistakes but there's a time crunch with that. You, you don't want 30 people sitting there in pain. you got to get them taken care of. And so it, it, there's no job that you're going to find stress-free, but the rewarding part of it has to benefit the stress part of it. So, And Amanda, if they want to, I can. Uh, am I able to share my screen? I can show you a picture of Umi. You should be able like to picture. Yeah, is that okay? Do we got time? Yeah, uh, I just want to throw in a thing. So we will be having a virtual tour, and you can do this while you're pulling up your screen. Sure. And we'll have a virtual tour of campus. So I know some of you have signed up for that. Um, Cameron McDonald is our student who's going to be taking you on that. So if you did sign up or if you just are interested in seeing the campus, it's going to give a really awesome tour. And you guys can kind of see NKU virtually. Um, if you just stick around, um, she is here and ready. So when we are done with Jason, you guys will be able to take that and do that experience as well. So please stay if that was something you were interested in. Yeah, so now what you see is you see our replica of Umi. And we've actually had people ask us how we got Umi out of his cartonage. That is the 3D print. That is literally... Uh, that is literally what Umi looks like down to the details. You can see white teeth there. Uh, his eyes are closed. We can see the fingernails. We can see his arms are actually underneath of him. So you're not his hands. So you're not gonna be able to see them. Uh, but we can see his fingernails, his toenails, uh, his teeth, uh, his lips, his ears. You can see his ears uh, over here. And this is the board that he's laying on. And so we reprinted it as well. And it actually has some... Um, uh, it actually has um, some symbols on it that we were able to to see um, that um, they, they weren't able to identify before. So we can actually tell that it's got carvings on it and we can tell what they look like. All right. So. Uh -oh. is, that, is, that, now is that better? I don't know if I was covering it or not. Is that better? Yeah. See that? yeah so if you, if you look, you can see that they notched out for the neck. Uh, this board was made specifically for Umi, um, and it, it was actually very interesting just to see to see what all they'd done for it. All right. Well, we had a very lively Q and A, so that was awesome. Yeah. I want to thank everybody who participated. I want to thank everybody who joined. Um, uh, it was really amazing to hear from Jason about all of um, the radiologic science field and his UMI project um, and 3D printing as well. So that was always very interesting whenever we get to chat with him. But I want to thank everybody. And I especially want to give thanks to Jason for taking time and joining us in this um, virtual field trip that we had today. Um, we will be having another virtual field trip next week on um, 
our lovely Professor Dave Wilkerson from Social Work. He will be joining us to talk a little bit about um, what, what all you can do in the social work field and also um, what uh, he's been working on as far as, you know, things from substance abuse to working with police to working in jails, um, just to kind of show you guys the social work field. So we hope that you guys can all, um, I know quite a few of you are signed up for that. We hope you all can join us for that um, virtual field trip too. Um, and thank you again for coming. Um, Jason, feel free to keep throwing images out or. Yeah, you, yeah I'm just scrolling through while you're talking to them. So they <laughs> if can you're see ready it. to leave, feel free. Um, and I will turn the camera and controls over to Cameron McDonald. Um, who is our student um, who's gonna be giving the virtual tour of NKU. Sure, all right, great. 